Hello, and welcome to Autodesk University. We are so excited to have you here today to talk about optimizing your business around industrialized construction. I am joined by some of my amazing colleagues that I will introduce you to shortly, and thank you so much for joining us here today. A little, little bit about me. I'm the Vice President of Industrialized Construction Strategy and Evangelism. Most of you know me as the Queen of Prefab, and we're going to talk about some amazing ways that Autodesk can help you on your journey for industrialized construction today. So what is industrialized construction? Many of you have seen us talk about the house that industrialized construction built. It's not just about the physical pieces and parts, but also about foundational enablers like technology and process. Things like the internet of things, big data and analytics. As we think about buildings in the future that are going to be autonomous and sensors that make digital twin a reality, and also the way in which we're able to access information on the cloud, which we definitely know from the last couple of years here during the pandemic, how important those things are. Those are very important the industrialized construction strategy as we think about building buildings as broken down components instead of just one-offs every time that we want to get information from. Also, we have our process enablers like lean manufacturing and building information modeling where we want to inf inform that eye with more intelligence and build upon the amazing data that we already have in the Revit environment today. Many of you have seen me talk about DFMA, and in the past, I would say design for manufacturing and assembly, but we've evolved that thinking to start saying data for manufacturing and assembly to make sure that our designs are informed with data for the manufacturing process, as well as other data like sustainability information and anything you might wanna provide insights about how things are made to inform your design. Then on the upper left, you'll see the prefabrication continuum. Things like advanced building products that come right from manufacturers that reduce drying time, curing time, hot work, anything that makes things easier on the jobs that you can buy from manufacturers, single trade assemblies, multi-trade assemblies that have the name describes multi-trades within that component, and then volumetric modular, which is, there's no hierarchy. It's really more like a kit of parts and those parts, we're going to talk about how they evolve from prefabricated pieces and parts to productization, where eventually the word we'll be saying is manufactured product. And so that's the physicality of this. And we want that data that informs design to include advanced building methodologies like robotics and automation, as well as additive manufacturing, because we don't just want to make things by hand. We want to automate them and use the latest and greatest technology and machinery and tooling to create these buildings in the built environment. So why is this happening right now? Why are we here talking about industrialized construction? Well, technology has changed. This is no longer just, you know, my phone. It's converged. It's now my phone. It's my babysitter. It's my entertainment. It's my matchmaker, maybe. It's my, my map so I know where I'm going in life process has actually converged and we're seeing design make and operate those processes not just need to be connected but they really need to inform one another so industries have really converged and that's why we're seeing industrialized construction come to the forefront of many of our customers conversations because ultimately their business models have already changed we know that we hear you. We know you're not just working within the silo of just design or just construction or just as an owner or just a manufacturer, but we know that this is converging across the silos and those walls are breaking down so that we have to understand how to enable better things for you and your new business model. I'll tell you that we talk a lot about change here in my group at Industrialized Construction and also throughout Autodesk. And I'll tell you that you need to understand that change happens first when you're dissatisfied with how the way things are now. Hopefully at Autodesk University, I know we are showing you a vision for what's possible. And we wanna give you some first concrete steps of action because you'll need all that to overcome resistance as Dan Miller taught us. And so you'll hear us talk a little bit about transforming your companies. And we work within this framework of transformation. And if you follow the Watch Now portion of Autodesk University, you'll see me go through this again as I talk about from prefabrication to productization, that we don't just need outcomes for what we want to achieve, 
but we need a strategy on how to get there. And there are foundational things that are so important that if you skip over, you won't be able to achieve that. And then productization as that watch now um, presentation will show you all the way up from digitization, connection, optimization, and ultimately circularity because digital waste ultimately leads to physical waste. So we wanna think about how we can reuse everything, not just for environmental, but for our process, for our industry and our ecosystem of industries to make sure we can be the best we can be. So how can Autodesk help you as a partner on this journey? We know that this is a partnership that makes this most valuable. So let me introduce some of the most amazing people. If you want to read their bios in totality in the handout for this session, I won't go too into it because I think you'll be able to read it for yourself, but we're gonna be talking with Ryan McMahon, Director of Product for Industrialized Construction, somebody I'm lucky enough to work with every day on these types of things. And we'll also work with Allison Scott, one of the amazing thought leaders and also Director of Construction Thought Leadership and Customer Marketing here at Autodesk. Tiffany Bachmeyer, I am lucky as well to work with all of these people. She and I work very closely as the Director of Global m and and Advanced Manufacturing. She'll talk to you about our Convergence Consulting team and how they can support you. And last and certainly not least, when we want to talk about the future and what is possible, there's no one better than Mike Haley, our Vice President of Research. So with that, I'm going to hand this off so that these wonderful people can tell you how we can help you through your industrialized construction journey in these areas. First, I'll hand it off to Ryan McMahon. Thank you, Amy. Great introduction, excited to talk about this. Can we move to the next slide, please? So I wanna to touch on a little bit more detail in some of the concepts that Amy mentioned in, in the introduction there. When we talk about data for manufacturing and assembly, we really need to help our customers develop the data that represents what they make and how it can be modified and how it's produced. It's much more than just what the physical representation is in the, in the design uh, and how it's consumed at design. This data defines what the construction product is that the trades produce in support of many different projects, not just bespoke things that are, are prefabricated and included in one building, but how do they support many of the similar things that, that are provided uh, to many different building projects that they work with? And it's also to, used to inform uh, building design. This is why DFMA is often misunderstood. So with that, productization is really more than what you make. It's really about more than what you make and ship. It's about how you operate your business, how you scale it across many customers and many projects, and how do you implement uh, and optimize your processes to support them all. By defining construction products, companies can borrow means and methods from manufacturing to optimize their processes, material use, and quality, and, and be more responsible or responsible, more responsive and deliver faster to their customers. These dynamic construction products really can then be shared with architects to inform their design choices at the beginning of the process so that they know these things can actually be made. Uh, the, uh, All right. <laughs> no worries. So when you use these during the design process, productization improves, accelerates uh, many of the processes and improves certainty of their delivery. The designer knows during the design process that what they're specifying and customizing is actually feasible and manufacturable. That's really the, the key benefit of this dynamic content. And lastly, it frees them up to spend more time working on the, the activities that really do require design and custom work, like the functionality or the aesthetics uh, of a particular building. Uh, and then the last slide here, Autodesk delivers robust manufacturing capabilities that our, our construction customers should adopt to get started with productization and manufacturing methods. And we're building uh, the capabilities that help connect fabrication with design to inform, uh, to deliver this informed design processes. And we will digitally connect design, make and assemble and operate processes to streamline your workflows. So with that, I will hand it off. Allison Scott, help us with connecting design and, and design construction and design making, please. Thank you so much, Amy. And thanks, Ryan, for setting us up there and understanding what is informed design. So uh, in our world, right, we talk a lot about what is connected construction. And now the power of connected construction doesn't live within this conceptual box of construction administration or construction management as a phase alone. 
It's real power is when we amplify and leverage the data, the geometry that's coming from that informed design process, that's coming from planning, that's coming from the productization process as Ryan was describing, and we're putting it to work in the construction phase so that we're getting better outcomes. And we're also looking for more predictability throughout that life cycle. So making a building is kind of like the ultimate group project, right? I mean, everyone has to bring their best uh, attitude to the table, their best skills to the table. Folks are assigned different parts of the project. But if certain team members are working off of an outline that's two weeks old, or they didn't get to weigh in on something as part of a project that impacts their piece of the pie, then soon enough, all of those pieces are not going to work together. This is the reality that we deal with right now, day to day in the design and making in the design and construction process. So what connected construction is really doing is helping to reduce these miscommunications. It's connecting the dots in a more seamless way so that we can create an even playing field for people to have access to what they need when they need it and to have their work informed by earlier steps in the process. So ultimately, if you can go to the next slide there, Amy, you know, connected construction is truly about minimizing the risks and using automation on how information is shared and so that we can eliminate the duplication of tasks. That's a lot of what Ryan was just talking about is how are we beginning to streamline this data, pull together and productize it and create more predictability. This process is also powered by an integrated and connected platform. And this is really important. We want that information to be shared. We want it to be connected. We want it to be updated once instead of toggling between systems and instead of having the human error of, of data missing. We want to minimize that data loss and we want to save time and resources in the process. So by connecting tools and data, we can also share across teams. We create this centralized hub with project information, increasing the quality and the efficiency of the project ahead. So we do begin to see these kinds of outcomes that Huang is starting to talk about here on this slide where we're getting to not just informed design, but then informed decisions. If we can get to the next slide, Amy. So one of the things that's really interesting about all of this for me is that the way that raw data and even things like design intent are getting transformed into information in the construction process. So traditionally, what does it really look like, right? <clears throat> we see a lot of manual processes. Of course, the human brain power and our experiences. So we've got a lot of spreadsheets, we've got a lot of phone calls, meetings, back of a napkin, sketching. This is all institutional knowledge, right? And it's all very applicable, but so many of our processes in construction are relying on these embedded and the lived experiences of our seasoned professionals. And frankly, while it's very valuable, it's very hard to capture for it to be used over and over again. That's where, we're that's where we see challenges and, and inefficiencies beginning to happen. So the power that technology and productized approaches and a connected platform really begin to apply for us is that we're seeing this information begin to unlock our ability to harness the project data. We begin to organize it, interpret it, uncover patterns faster and be able to put it to work in a more actionable way so that the human workforce that it takes to actually make this data put to work is much more immediately accessible. That is our goal, make the data actionable. Next slide, Amy. We also know that design, when design is informed, there are big, big benefits that start to happen in construction. In fact, we're doing some research around this right now. So we have found with our own construction intelligence research team that projects which have had profit margin erosion in their, in their project, they tend to have around 50% more RFIs with a root cause in the coordination phase. Right, which when is and when does the coordination phase happen? It tends to happen at the intersection between design and construction. So when we dig further into data like this, we also found that roughly 70% of RFIs are specifically stemming from design and documentations, errors and emissions. So one of the strategies that we can employ knowing this for our industry is that when you have a true and more robust design review process, up front, you're gonna see downstream impact, which really just means we're, we need to get the designers, the engineers, the fabricators, the manufacturers, the contractors in the room earlier to see problems before they start. And that's also where innovation begins to happen. Uh, if you can go into the next slide, Amy. 
So when we put this into context of things like productization and industrialized construction, the upsides are massive. So if we've created an informed design, we have informed construction, and we're, we're, we're connecting on a technology platform that is open and integrated and, and sharing the data back and forth in a bi-directional way, then we're truly poised to improve quality, cost, schedule, safety, as well as potentially profit margin. Plus, we're then also capturing those lessons learned and applying them to the next project, which is what you were talking about, Amy, this idea of circularity and really optimizing that knowledge that's been used throughout the project lifecycle. Last slide, Amy, for me. So moving towards this process of working does not happen overnight. Driving towards a more resilient and future-proof business takes a lot of time. It takes people, it takes resources, and it takes a lot of energy to adapt. But we know for resiliency that you need three things. You need a willingness to transform, you need a culture that enables change, and you need a technology strategy to help you get there. And the backbone of all of this is digital transformation, which does look different for everybody. But the good news is, is that we are helping, actively helping customers right now take steps towards digital transformation. So I'm gonna help uh, kick it off here and share it all over to Tiffany, who's gonna talk a little bit more about how we help you unlock those next steps. Thank you so much, Allison. And before I do that, I just wanted to remind everybody, if you have questions, comments, thoughts, please reach out to us in the platform with the Q&A panel. We are happy to have um, answer all of your questions, have an open discussion and dialogue with you all um, at the end of this. There will be plenty of time for that. So just a reminder of that. So how do we help customers actually achieve this um, through our consulting organization? So I lead, I lead a team within our consulting organization that is doing this very actively with Amy and, and all of the rest of the amazing experts on this team um, that are talking to you today. And we really, we see this as an opportunity to come alongside our customers truly as trusted advisors to deliver that same transformation framework that you saw Amy show earlier in the slides um, that really take us through all those steps of, of where we need to get to from foundational all the way up to that circularity. Go ahead, next slide, Amy. So our mission as we do this is really to partner with those customers desiring convergence, the, tr the convergence customers that we have, applying the manufacturing best practices to connect our manufacturing informed design, optimizing manufacturing, accelerating construction and assembly through productization, digitization, data reuse, and platform optimization to provide better business outcomes, operations, and sustainable practices. It's a mouthful, but that's truly what we're doing within consulting and alongside product and with what you'll see with Mike with research later. We want to be that bridge in between those, those areas to really help bring that realization to our customers. Go ahead, next slide, Amy. And some of the ways that we do that is what you're seeing on screen right now. These are just different ways that we can come alongside through workshops and, and bringing that foundational methodology along with the advanced technology that we have, being able to fill gaps as we work through those and we work with product and we look towards those, those digitization practices. And then even through how do we optimize and ultimately automate workflows for our customers. Go ahead, next slide. And this, while, while provocative in slide, just as an example of some of the practices that we're bringing to um, the, the thought processes and the thought leadership that we have within our manufacturing team to also bring alongside our construction customers and some of the things, while I know it's not an exact parody here, this is a very high profile manufacturing example from our aerospace industry, representing a great example of what the future state is that we really want to help the, the construction industry achieve through these best practices that have been developed in manufacturing over decades. This is a very large structure, totally fabricated in separate modules all around the world and assembled in a factory environment, very similar to a construction site. And you can see all the reasons why this happens on, on in that blue box, but that's really the same ideas and methodology that we're applying just in a different way uh, within the construction industry. Now, we love being that bridge to help for the today, but what if it's not fully achievable today? And with that, I'd like to send it over to Mike. 
Mm -hmm. Thanks, Tiffany. Um, I'm glad you asked that question. <laughs> so um, we're going to explore three examples of how our research team is collaborating with customers to explore all these futures of industrialized construction. Um, you can go to the next slide, Amy. Our first one is a moonshot where we're exploring how we can produce mass housing that is both affordable and sustainable using these industrialized construction methods. Next slide. <clears throat> this project is being done in collaboration with our partners at Factory OS. Factory OS builds prefabricated housing modules and manages the entire design to build process. We're focusing our efforts on the sustainability and impact of their products while also achieving efficiencies in their building process. Amy said something earlier, which I absolutely love, which is digital waste leads to physical waste. So that's exactly the kind of spirit that we are going into this project with. We want to digitize this entire process so that we can understand where there are opportunities to improve and have, have lower impact in the world. Next slide. So one such example of our tools is how we are deploying multi-scale optimization technology. This allows designers to explore the objectives and the constraints of a project from multiple points all across that design, make, and operate pipeline. So we're looking at that whole life cycle and really optimizing what that's critical. Data and relationships in the system are searchable and they're mappable, which are giving designers a clear picture of the downstream impact of every design decision they make. Again, something that everybody's just spoken about, having the data and the knowledge about all the components all the way through and the effect it has on the final solution is really, really key to how this is going to operate in the future. Next slide. Yep. I think that's the same slide. Here we go. No, okay. This quarter, we're concluding our sustainability assessments of Factory OS's Block 9 project. So Block 9 is a 141 studio apartment complex that's slated to open late this year in San Francisco. Next slide. We've calculated material waste, material cost, embodied carbon and operational carbon of one of the modules and one of the units of block nine. And now we've broken it down into all the subcategories you're seeing on this slide. Now this information can be used to optimize future designs and processes to further improve these metrics. Effectively, they become the baselines for what they want to do in the future. Next slide. So that's great, but let's, let's focus a little bit deeper now on the actual construction process itself. And let's explore how we can apply some of the learnings from manufacturing to industrialized construction. You saw Tiffany talking about the aerospace project. There's many places where we can take the learnings from manufacturing and bring it over to the, this world of industrialized construction and hopefully leapfrog um, some of the processes. Next slide. So a great example here is Apis Core. So Apis Core is a startup that designs and builds equipment that 3D prints with concrete. Um, they joined our, our research technology network to solve design and manufacturing challenges of their equipment and grow their customer use cases. Next slide. With their improved equipment, after they'd worked with us for a while, they completed the world's largest 3D printed building on site in Dubai, standing two stories at 7,000 square feet. A project, this is a project that was made possible by people that believed in the future of automation, and they were also willing to take a risk to try something new. However, building codes vary all over the world. So they were also trying to explore how to overcome many of the limitations for innovation within the existing US building code. Through our network, they met fellow resident and internationally recognized engineering firm, Thornton Tomasetti, and together they paved the way forward. Next slide. Producing a specification document to support every building permit application and opening doors to 3D printing their first affordable housing units in the United States, including a nonprofit organization in Florida with a development of 800 homes, a housing trust fund in Santa Barbara County resulting in the first 3D printed affordable home in California, also using sustainable materials, 
and another in Louisiana, which happened to be the first 3D printed US multifamily home. So a really significant impact in how 3D printing is affecting um, you know, housing and industrialized construction. Uh, next slide. So my last example, um, we're going to look at how we could further leverage the intersection that we talked about between manufacturing and, and industrialized construction by exploring robotic printing, material science, sensors and data analytics. Remember, that was something that Amy talked a lot about in the beginning. IoT, data flow is a critical part of that. And we're going to look at it in the context of infrastructure, specifically bridges. So renowned design and engineering firm DAR approached Autodesk with a vision of reimagining their entire design and manufacturing process, specifically for these large civil engineering structures. The goal was to get to AI-driven workflows while leveraging DAR's legacy data and expertise to 3D print an active, sensorized living bridge. Next slide. We use generative design algorithms in Fusion 360 to design the bridge based on the constraints of the environment in which the bridge is being used. Generative design was also able to improve minimum wall thickness and overhang angles of the bridge. On the robot itself, we used single point thermal sensors to take the temperature of the part and decide whether to pause or continue printing, making the entire process automated. During printing, we can detect, detect tiny temperature variations in the material, which could indicate future areas of weaknesses. This initial test bridge has been printed from ADS plastic with 20% carbon fiber. And once we're done with the test, it will be ground down and reused. The, the, the bridge also has embedded fiber optic strain sensors throughout it. So it's actually physically embedded into the material of the bridge, making it a living bridge. The full-scale bridge will ultimately use recycled plastic, allowing us to move past traditional material and seek ones that have less of an impact on the world. Anyway, hopefully these projects give you some sense of the future potential that lies ahead for industrialized construction. And I'm going to hand it back over to Amy. Thank you. Thank you guys so much. I really appreciate all of that. So what can our IC team do for you? Other than Autodesk University, we participate in lots of events and customer briefings, as well as internal trainings within your organizations. And if you are participating in some of our executive councils, you'll see us participating in those as well. And we participate in many of those external councils and consortiums that exist around the globe. We also, as Ryan mentioned, work with some product betas right now, especially between Inventor and Revit, and for manufacturing software to actually inform design and allow for you to create products instead of just prefabricating some things potentially downstream. We're working very hard on platform integration to make sure the Autodesk platform supports everything that you're trying to accomplish on your journey in industrialized construction. And we are always obviously interested in any products that are out there that participate either with us as partners um, at Autodesk that can become part of Autodesk or part of the Autodesk platform in one of our partnership areas. The other part on services, Tiffany talked a little bit about convergence consulting, and that is an area that's been exploding for us as many of our customers are very interested in how we can assist them on not just productizing the physicality of these piece parts, but on the associated workflows that both Ryan and Ali Scott talked about and how we connect these things together so that we have informed design and then connecting design and make together. You heard Mike talk about some amazing research. By the way, we had to choose from so many projects we could have talked about in research, inclusive, not, by the way, there's a little bit of a convergence between consulting and research as well, that they work so often together when we're doing these projects with our customers and some of it we can work on today and some where we're willing to you know, take a little more risk where they work in conjunction together with both research and convergence consulting together. And I would be remiss if I didn't talk about, you heard Mike Haley talk about some of the um, fellows that were able to discuss some of those projects within the resident program, the residency program at our technology centers. They've gone virtual, not just in the locations you may have visited us at Autodesk before, but you can actually be a virtual resident. And we're seeing lots of programs, lots of uh, people talking with each other. There's tons of information, people doing business together that are part of these technology centers and the residency program. Very important. And some of the cool stuff that's happening over there is not happening anywhere around the world, but for in these places. 
So I know we have some questions and answers. And as Jazad, who also works in our industrialized construction team, is going to be taking us through some of those. I have a few questions as um, that have come in already. Do you want me to start with some of those? Yeah, you go ahead and start with those, please, while we're waiting for the audience to, uh, to loosen up with some of their questions. By the way, we always take questions and challenges. I've changed all of my Q&A slides to questions and challenges. We're open for that as well. So, Ryan, let's start with you because you talked a lot about how do we move basically the make information of manufacturing and what we actually can fabricate and make in fabrication facilities and in manufacturing facilities. How do we move that information up in front of design? And there is two words I heard, both prefabrication, as I mentioned, and productization. What's the difference between the two words that we talk about? Great question. Let's start with the, the latter part there. What's the difference between prefab and productization? I, you know, I think you know, prefab is kind of part of the story. It's an opportunity to make something off-site, near site in a controlled environment, better safety, uh, but uh, you know, use fixturing, you know, lots, lots of benefits of, of working in that particular way. But if you only ever make one of something, you miss out on a tremendous amount of benefit of scale and repeatability for making lots and lots of, of a particular item. So, you know, given that that Mike showed the factory OS video, if we were to make a um, you know an apartment unit. And we made, you know, you know, lots of, there was a, how many, or there's 300 or some odd units in that, in that building there. We want to make a lot of similar things, but not make them all identical. Can we define a product that represents that particular unit and all the ways that we can vary it? So that, that by doing that, now I get the advantage of being able to make something in a controlled environment and be able to, being able to define something and the ways that it can change so that we have a process that we can drive much more like manufacturing. So if I think about Tiffany's slide, which by the way, Tiffany, I've been showing that slide for years, right? And sometimes construction and manufacturing folks agree on it. And sometimes they disagree because there aren't too many buildings that are like airplanes. Although I would tell you all prefabricated or manufactured and flies through the air, not sitting on the ground, same as ships. Like we don't have the risk of water and air. Our buildings are on the ground mostly. But when I see that and I connect it to what Ryan's saying, we don't necessarily have to have all those pieces and parts look exactly as they look in that plane all the time. You could vary some of those as the architect and only use some of those parts in the building and scale them differently, size them differently, change the capacities and not have to make the entirety of the plane, right? So that's that's where you're looking at a lot of this stuff. You're really morphing these customers and, and taking what you know in proven manufacturing and evolving them from construction companies in some cases or owners that want to enable this or architects and engineers. Tell me about how Convergence Consulting is best suited to do that at Autodesk. Sure. It, and you're absolutely right. I mean, that was why I said it was a bit provocative to share it, but it's the idea of bringing that methodology. It's not, it's not the one-to-one -one parody. It's the idea that we can, we can bring these these very foundational methodologies that we've used, I mean, name the industry across manufacturing. You often talk generators, there's ideas of, of um, automotive as well. I mean, you could talk about this in a lot of different ways, but it's that idea, exactly what Ryan was just talking about um, around looking at things with that product, productization mindset and then applying that to these industry strategies to be able to help people achieve what they need to achieve in their business tomorrow. And that's truly the opportunities that we're seeing today with these customers is being able to, you know, we bridge gaps and in, in Autodesk Consulting today, you know, we have a team of enterprise solution architects, industry strategy, business consultants, as well as, as um, technology experts within our team that, that all bridge those gaps across these industries to really help bring as much thought leadership and, and these methodology approaches to help people transition. So no matter where people are in that journey with us, we can help them. We can see, okay, where are you today? And then how do you get to where you're trying to achieve to for tomorrow? And that's really the goal that we have in consulting. You know, it's crazy, Tiffany, we had a big event recently last June, and we had all of our biggest customers in the room. There were almost a thousand people, both virtually and in person um, at another event. And we asked, once we described what convergence was, we actually asked, 
how many of you would consider yourselves convergence customers, no longer just a contractor or just a subcontractor? And 82% of the audience describe themselves as convergence customers. Now, if they're evolving into manufacturing and we're a bunch of construction folks sitting in a room, It's like trying to be a manufacturer without having a manufacturer tell us how to be manufacturers, right? It's like, you know, that's the beauty of convergence consulting is that you get all the benefits of all the amazing manufacturing consulting we've done across the globe with unbelievable things that you and Mike have done. And we're really able to apply those things that seem like almost old hat to you Mm -hmm. to space within the AEC community. I mean, is that really what's happening with these customers? Are are we using proven technologies then? that we've done forever. Absolutely. And that's, that's the joy and the excitement of being, you know, people might've looked at when you first did those bios of why is this woman with the title of advanced manufacturing on this call? But that's why is because I lead a team of manufacturing experts, but that are being able to bridge those gaps and bring those things into the construction industry for us to be able to achieve those, those goals. So the things that we're doing with our manufacturing customers, and we're helping them achieve the next possible and the next things that we're doing, we're then being able to also bring those methodologies and those, um, those, those industry expertise into the evolving world of that within construction. At perfect time. Oops, sorry. Let me go back one. Perfect timing for Ali Scott. Ali, so now we just said, if you get a bunch of construction people in the room and architects and engineers and even owners that need our services, how many of these companies want to start and have already started defining what they make? Think all the fab shops. Think how how is that important, that prefabrication mm-hmm. evolution to productization to connect that to both design and then share it in construction. Like, tell me what's going on with the customers that we're seeing that are using the Autodesk Construction Cloud and why this is important. Absolutely, so there's a couple of things happening. One, we already know, like you just said, Amy, that there are a significant number of people in architecture, engineering, and construction that are no longer just bound by that singular definition, right? We see lots of firms across AEC deciding to go upstream and add more, the pre-construction, more design, more more urban planning, more test fit solutions, pre-construction solutions to their bench. We also see people going downstream and saying, hey, I wanna get more into um, operations and asset management and providing digital twin solutions to my clients. So there is a massive shift in our entire industry for converging across our own industry lines, as well as dipping into cross industries like manufacturing um, that we've that we've just described. So where this becomes really interesting for things like the use of Autodesk Construction Cloud and this notion of connected construction is that if we want to embrace new business models like this, if we want to take advantage of new profit margins and, and new services and new revenue streams, We cannot operate with the same way that we've been operating before. Connected construction is way more than just digitizing the existing processes and the existing paper solutions and silos that we've been operating with in the past, right? We cannot expect acceleration and innovation by just digitizing a paper process. We've got to find ways to streamline and accelerate across the entire life cycle. So what I think is kind of interesting out of this is like, could we really imagine a world where an RFI never existed? I mean, I think that that's what we're trying to go for, right? That's exactly what Ryan is starting to identify. It's like, if we have product solutions that are baked into our own tools, we're going to get closer to that kind of reality. Um, The other interesting thing is that this is not just a problem or a solution or an opportunity for contractors. Architects are living this challenge every single day. Architects, in fact, have a lot of pressure on them. There's a ton amount, there's a ton of risk in their day-to-day jobs. Um, And we we see this in their environments when their their amount of design, the amount of detail that they have to, 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 to give over to the contractor is significant. And yet somehow it's still not enough. And why is it not enough? It's because those processes are disconnected. So if we're able to take all of that rich data, geometry and process that an architect and an engineer is creating in those early stages and really transfer that over and with a, with a full picture in a holistic way to, to construction, wow, what kind of power does that unlock? And we are beginning to see this with a number of our customers. In fact, I suggest that our, the people that are watching today go check out a couple of different of our construction uh, oriented classes on AU. 
uh, in, the, in the session catalog. Uh, you can also um, absolutely watch the construction keynote tomorrow with Jim Lynch, Samir Merchant, and Brandon LeCourcier. We've got some great um, feedback from some of our customers that are talking about their process where they're talking about digital transformation and connecting this, this data uh, between design and construction and down into operations. We also have some awesome interviews from contractors that are in the watch anytime section of the AU platform where you can learn a little bit more about these details uh, in action today. And you're there too, Allison Scott. I know you're <laughs> in the watch. I've seen you there. You're right there near where my thing is in the watch. Yes, That's yes. We, we, we've got some great co content from yourself and from me talking about how resiliency uh, is enabled by digital transformation. You cannot future-proof your business without digital transformation and what does that entail? And then you've given us a great example with the transformation framework and, and how you make it real. So yeah, really great that. content. And so I know as Jazat, our, our moderator, we have lots of questions coming in, additional questions. Should I pause and go to you before? I, I want to definitely talk to Mike again, but. They're coming thick and fast, but Amy, why don't you uh, drop, a, drop that question off to Mike and then we'll, uh, we'll jump onto the audience questions after that. Fantastic. So Mike, I think what's so cool about what you're doing over in research is that you are really, you've been seeing the convergence happening before we did, right? So lots of these projects, it's so interesting to me as I look across and I sit on one of the boards over there in research, mm -hmm. like we're looking for more and more convergence customers that want us to solve for this. Because yeah. as Allison said, I think it's so interesting. It's like, you need that data, but that data just can't live in somebody's desktop. It has to actually not just live in mm -hmm. some you know isolated place. We've got to be able to house it somewhere, share it, make sure that we know what to do with that data, test some things out because the mm -hmm. data is very different I, I, I would love the world, by the way, Allison, where there are no more RFIs. And I always say, we'll get there <laughs> one product at a time, right? Like I think mm -hmm. as we move to this, you know, where buildings become more and more productized, it won't happen overnight. We have to build sort of like one digital book in a digital library at a time with the sort of the, the, the workflows with them. But what you are seeing over by you, Mike, what has really changed in the last few years when you were already projecting this out years ago, mm -hmm. when we started mm -hmm. working with these convergence customers? What's different now? Yeah, I mean, I think it's really, it's, it's, it's in, and, in and of itself, it's a convergence of a lot of factors, right? So, I mean, I mean, there's, you know, I, I've been working on cloud technologies, honestly, for 20 years. And in fact, 20 years in construction. And I can tell you 20 years ago, people didn't want to put things even in the cloud. Uploading a document was kind of a weird thing to do, right? That's not really an attitude anymore, you know, so, so data's flowing into the cloud. Um, but that's not enough. Um, you're also seeing advancements in sensor technology. So, you know, I gave that example of the bridge with those fiber optic sensors and it turns out you can 3D print fiber optic sensors and put it in stuff and they're really cheap. So why not just do it all the time and collect all the data, right? Um, you're also seeing changes in manufacturing processes. So some of the stuff I showed you, some of the stuff Tiffany talked about, I mean, that's all changing at the same time. Um, and then I think you've got all the pressures that Alison talked about. You know, you want to do more, you want more detail, you want to get the stuff going. So you've but all these factors happening concurrently. So you're right. We 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 we've seen this coming for more than a decade, to be honest. And one of the this is one of the reasons I love running a research organization at Autodesk because you know we get to look through the lens of construction, manufacturing, entertainment, even, and look at all of those things together. Inside research, we have a group we call Industry Futures that is actually created specifically to focus at industries. And all the examples that I spoke about today, they're one of the key groups in working with those customers to explore these futures and discover these things. I mean, then we have, you know, we talked about the technology networks and our outside networks that bring in these folks to help think of this together and you know generally the way we look at this and what i'll leave with amy is that you know the way we like to think about this in research is we start with feasibility we look at the fundamental technology trends and say can we even do this? Is, it gonna, is the data going to flow? Are we going to have the right representations at the right time? Then we need to get to viability. When you plug this all together, will this actually work? And we cannot do that without customers like the ones I talked about and many of the others, similar to the ones that Tiffany works with. And then finally, we've got to get to desirability. Does everybody really, really want this? Is this going to just take over the industry? And I would say industrialized construction is now well into that viability phase. And I mean, it's teetering on desirability. So there's a, the, the convergence has happened, the acceleration is there. And I think the use we're seeing the bolder customers and bolder people around the world begin to adopt this. Agreed. As let's go to some of the, into the thick of it, if, as they say. 
Let's do that. So yeah, firstly, thank you to the audience for posing some of the questions and challenges so far. Uh, I'd like to start with one from David Stutzman. I think he's, he's really hit the nail on the head here, which is how can we challenge the industry to think of buildings as assemblies before mm. starting design so that the design can leverage the potential of productization and prefab rather than backfitting it after the design is underway? Well, I'll take that one as the first answer and then let everyone chime in. I think expecting architects, my friend Stan Chu at Gensler always says, don't look to me for the data of every manufactured product around the world as if I have in my head or I know what it is. And not just that, but as Ryan said, we don't just want to make buildings as components where you have to, as an architect, like we say, you can use any color as long as it's black. That's not true, like, or pink or whatever the color, right? Like we want to make sure that you become that architect that's freed up because you have productization that allows you to customize both the things that are productized and utilize them in things like generative design, where you can pick the right combination of products for you and let, let the technology do that. Let the technology house and inform your decisions, and then you can customize them and truly be the architect of the parameters that you want, right? That's important. Um, and so I think first we have to frame it correctly so that people don't feel like what they're doing doesn't exist anymore. In fact, my friends that are in architecture are so thrilled they may never have to draw fire stairs again. You know, like they're like fantastic. If I can import that, pick the right scalability and performance requirements of these products, it frees them up to go do amazing things with artistry in bespoke areas of the building or to spend more time on the user end requirements and parameters. That's really important. So I think first you have to show the, the ecosystem what's in it for them and how this enhances and changes their business models to be more productive, um, create better returns on investments for their companies. And, you know, look, I don't know a lot of architects these days that are getting paid on hours or number of drawings anymore. That time is over. They, they are looking for new business models. They want to understand what their next phase of their life is in their business. And industrialized construction plays a big part in that as long as we can show them the pathway. Does anybody else want to chime in? One of the things that comes to mind for me, Amy, is, um, <clears throat> and I, I love that you framed it up on, on sort of how important it is to the architect's role in this because it's 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 critical, it's crucial. Um, there's also a super important role in the um, in the role of the owner, right? In the on the in the clients and that where and where is it originating from? So I think it's a huge space. And I, I've heard you speak about this incredibly eloquently, so I'm not going to be able to capture the same way you think about it. But just knowing that there's there's so much opportunity for owners out there to acknowledge what kind of value can be earned through the process with industrialized construction and starting that from the very, very get-go, not putting the pressure on your contractor or your architect to make that decision, but really, really stepping in to say, hey, I want to be a leader in this and I'm going to bring my team along with me so that we can, we can achieve those outcomes that we're looking looking for, for this particular asset. And that's not just in the design and the construction phase, but that is absolutely in the operations phase as well, because there's a huge connection between the role of trends like industrialized construction and things like digital twin and getting better performance in the building yes. for the longer term. And that is also a huge play for owners out there that are managing large scale assets that are ready to take that next step. You want to talk about managing your pro forma or managing your building life cycle for the long term and circularity? Starting with industrialized construction is absolutely your first step. I love it. Tiffany's shaking her head because I know we talk owner <laughs> playbook with lots of our customers all the time. Yes. They have the all most the to mean, right, Tiffany? Totally. Absolutely. I mean, it, it, what Allison, what you said is, is so crucial to it because that is often the customers that we're working with the closest are the owners yeah. and, and how they're informing then what they, what they need out of the rest of, of their partners in the ecosystem. So yeah, I think that's really crucial. Okay, so, ask Ali, up. Ali and Tiff, um, great answers. And thanks, David, for the question. Uh, I've got another one here from Kristen that I'm going to pitch to Ryan and Mike. So she's curious to hear about more specific examples of software being used in workflow between design teams and manufacturers. Awesome. Great question. Uh, <clears throat> first off, you know, when we talk about the workflows, you know, in, in productization, we have a breadth of, of tools in our in our portfolio to solve the right kinds of problems. And we think that that productization means defining what you make with the full fabrication level of detail, bolts, nuts, and washers, um, and all of the constraints and the ways that change and the min and the max values, all of that kind of information, uh, modeling in that way with an engineering tool is really fundamental in defining what are, are the products that you make based on the processes that are available to you and the skills 
skills that you have in your factory and the materials and all of that. The challenge that we have is we today, or it's pretty commonplace to try to use Revit to capture all of that detail, uh, which, you know, it's a design tool. It's not an engineering tool. So how do we link these two worlds with the right kind of information to drive the right kinds of processes? So the workflows that we are really driving forward are, can I do this productization definition with a tool like Inventor, with a tool like Fusion, and then automatically create the appropriate representation that belongs in the Revit file? Can I interact with that template and say, oh, I need fire stairs that are, you know, this spacing between floors or different spacing um, and, and use that. So those are examples of the workflows that we are, are, are building. Um, and I just do wanna, wanna call out that there is a class taught by Andy Akinson and Justin Rice that's called Bridging the Construction and Manufacturing Gap with Inventor Product Templates that talks about this in much, much more detail. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, if you were listening carefully when I was speaking about the, the DAR bridge that we're working on in research, I mentioned Fusion 360 and generative design. And this is very much kind of the thing that Ryan was talking about. It's like, if you bring these tools together. Um, what an interesting thing I'll drill a little deeper on in this, this really relevant to this question is generative design. So, you know, generative design in the manufacturing space started out much like what Ryan talked about. It's like about bringing a bunch of constraints. What are your objectives? And it solves within those objectives and it creates some sort of shape or output from it. Um, we very rapidly realized, and this was not in AEC now, this is not in construction, we're purely just in manufacturing. 10 years ago, we very quickly realized we had to start adding the material being used, the constraints of the method of manufacturing being used as well into those, because otherwise you're gonna produce a design that can't be made or it's too expensive to be made. So what we do today in generative design is you actually specify are we 3D printing? If we are 3D printing, is it going to be with a plastic material like an ABS? Or are we going to be 3D printing concrete? Are we milling metal? What is it going to be? And the software then during the design process is able to optimize the generative design such that when you do get to manufacturing, it's actually ready to be manufactured and manufactured hopefully cheaply, but certainly in a reliable, doable sort of way. So again, that bridge that I showed you, if you look carefully on one of the slides, there was a couple of different generative designs. And the first one had very thin structure on. And those were designed without any limitation on that was just doesn't matter what the material is, it's the world's most perfectly strong 3D printed material that doesn't really exist, right? And then you all of a sudden tell it that it's ABS and it's going to be heated and printed with the robot. Well, then all of a sudden you start having to make those struts thicker and stronger because the, the, the plastic layers have to adhere to each other. So generative design can model that and include that into the design such that when they do get to manufacturing, they're more ready. I think also as I'd be remiss in not adding, we have something amazing at Autodesk called Forge. And Forge is what the platform at Autodesk is built on, as well as the technology that the Autodesk Construction Cloud is also built on. And that makes us very powerful with our customers' data, with working with you guys and helping you get that data across the platform from you know, the owner's requirements and form design into, you know, construction and manufacturing back around through operate. That's critical that you, one of the reasons Autodesk, I came here and we're talking about it later today, as, as you know, in another talk, Forge is so critical. The fact that we can connect all of this information together and many of our products, as I said, are already built on that Forge platform like Autodesk Construction Cloud. Thanks, Amy. Um, I think we've got time for one final question before we go to closing remarks and this one's for Amy and I, th I think you'll like this one it's so what is the connection between trends like industrialized construction and the emerging focus or opportunity of digital twin I love that question you know I always say if you uh really want to think about digital twins let's say it with an s at the moment for now right that the easiest way to think about how we want to work with buildings in the future is that if they're truly going to be acting autonomously, where they can tell us how they're operating, how the end users feel within them, actually how they're performing, not just as a building, but imagine a portfolio of buildings, even if you own them as a serial owner. You know, the, one of the great things about industrialized construction is that products, not just equipment, as we know digital twins have already been enabled through, but as we, these become, instead of just 
construction in situ to prefabrication as the evolution of, of the area to now products, productization and really manufactured products. We have that ability now, not just for the equipment inside this built environment to give us that data and information, but the building in and of itself. And you can attach those sensors or print them very inexpensively to everything and, and add that so that especially if you have the productized chassis of that piece of equipment you're going to reuse over and over again across multiple buildings, even if it's scaled differently, we start to collect data that we didn't have before. It's like every time you do something unique, you cannot collect data and reuse it if the next thing is going to be unique as well. And so I think industrialized construction becomes the chassis for much of this data enabled for digital twins, enhanced by IoT sensors and all the other information that can move across a platform like Forge. That's where it really becomes powerful. So it's not just for the piece of medical equipment, but for the entirety of the hospital that we can get this information so that you know people can heal faster and we can have better acting, you know, performing buildings and understand how they're interacting with us for lifetimes. And I think that's super important. Um, if you don't make that connection, digitizing the supply chain as well as these pieces and parts, you sort of missed, you missed it, right? And then we've got to make sure that people know that these things also converge. How is that as? Great, thanks, Amy. So listen, I've got, there's one other quick question, I think, that I'm gonna to pitch to Tiffany about convergence consulting. So this is from a prefab construction integrator in Canada that integrate multiple fabrication facilities and product types. Um, they're looking to be the technology pollinator for all of their partners. And the question is, would convergence consulting be the right partner to help assist them? Oh, I love pollinator. That's yeah. fantastic. Uh, yes, I would say let's talk because there is there are tons of opportunities then for us to partner, see where you are, see what we can do to come alongside you. And then even, you know, is there partnership opportunities to do alongside Amy's team and, and the things that we're doing um, across this, this entire ecosystem that you've heard here today um, to be able to influence even what you're already doing? within your company. So yes, I love that question. And thank you to the person who, who gave it. And yes, please contact us. We'd be happy to talk. Awesome. So Amy, let's leave the audience Q&A there. We've got a few minutes left just to, to close the session off. Well, first, let me thank all of the amazing people that are on this panel. Hopefully you can see my slide now with the audience that's up on the screen that doesn't say Q&A anymore. I just want to go back and summarize some of the stuff we talked about, talked about in the transformation framework, right? As you want certain outcomes and you create certain strategies, you know, we want to make sure that we're alongside you, helping you as a partner, as you assess some of the foundational skills and tools, along with the technology stack and your business architecture, to make sure that you're ready as these first few steps of transformation to what the new possible is and to make anything with Autodesk. I think don't forget productization is about the both the digital and the physical, right? So the physical piece part is the chassis, the workflow associated with it, the many, many different workflows of thousands of pieces and parts that will be productized so that we can reuse this data, right? Data reusability. I don't want to keep making hospitals where I chuck out the digital information at the end and I rebuild it every single time. I want to make sure we think about data reusability. And so that, like Allison Scott said, we can enable automation and connected process all the way from you know, operations and design and construction and, and, and then back around in the life cycle of, of what these buildings are supposed to do. We're not just getting people off paper. We're really working out these workflows to connect these things together and make sure that we can make them easier and more automated, quicker for you to give you more insights because that's really what platform thinking is. We wanna make sure you can get the information you need you know, built on Forge and at the Autodesk world in our platform. And also with the connective tissue that Forge allows to interact with the products that we have working here in some of these areas, along with an ecosystem of partners of products in the platform that fill in lots of digital glue that are gonna help you create these amazing workflows around the world, right? I always say my iPhone, it comes with preloaded things, but then I can put a million things on it to make those things work better in the way that I want them to work, not my neighbor who owns the same phone, right? We wanna be able to optimize this so that we can truly use things like generative design, like Mike Haley talked about in the manufacturing side in our AEC space and digital twins like I spoke about. Industrialized construction is an optimization. You don't start there, it's on your transformation framework. You have to 
go through the first steps of, you know, the one through four that we talked about, because ultimately we want circularity for our ecosystem. 40% of what's in our landfills right now is construction waste. We want waste avoidance. Productization is the single most important thing you can do to avoid that. We want digital and physical reuse. So with that, as I think that wraps up our time to make sure that we're on time today. Thank you to all of my panelists. Thank you for joining me. I really appreciate the generosity of your time for supporting the industrialized construction efforts here at Autodesk. Thank you. Thanks, Amy. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, everybody.